The elves are shrouded in mystery. I mean, one has to wonder how can they do the things that they do. When you play Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the story says that prior to the human city being constructed, this actually was the place for a massive elvish city thousands of years ago, but the elves performed some kind of spell that literally deleted the city from existence before they abandoned it and moved west. When you play Storm King's Thunder and you go to Silvery Moon, you learn that there is this incredible permanent spell cast on the city that prevents any adventurer while within from casting any fire spells, or teleport, or summon anything. An evil goblin can literally not go inside of the city because the magic within it prevents him from doing that. This type of magic we call a mythal, and it was invented by the elves. When you go into any of the massive forest cities of the elves, you tend to see these enormous thick trees where the elves make their homes. And you might wonder, how are these trees created? You might hear rumors that elves can transform into dryads, and you wonder how can this happen? It might surprise you to know that the reason the continent looks the way it does is because the elves fractured it using magic that shifted time and space. Let's dispel the dark curtain and finally talk about elves and their magics. The story about the beginnings of the elves vary tremendously depending on the origin myth being used. Of course, when it comes to it, we can't really prove any of them with any form of certainty. All of them, however, center on the main god of the elvish pantheon, Corlin Larethian. Corlin was a perfect shapeshifter with no true form to call its own. In the legends, he was described as being a stream, clouds, earth, the wind, and thunder. He could change his shape to literally anything, and he was said to be the true embodiment of free will and chaos. His flamboyant, mercurial personality was said to show through no matter which form it took, and the other gods accepted his mutability and passionate behavior, all of the gods except for Grumsh, the god of the orcs. The story says that the orc god slashed Corlin, and from his blood came the first elves, the primal elves. They were similar to Corlin in personality and mutability, but not nearly, of course, as powerful. Many of these primal elves would go on to live in many places of the multiverse, and they would spread around, though mostly they went to the Feywild a realm of unbridled passion which actually worked well with their personalities. Now this is where the myths start to depart from one another and many of the different stories diverge. The key here is that some of these primal elves were favorites to Coraline, and he imparted great power upon some of them, essentially turning them into gods. Corlin actually married one of these, one called Aroshni. Now this elvish goddess wanted more. She wasn't satisfied with simply being a god in Arvandor. She wanted to conquer the material plane and the other heavens too, and as such, she convinced the primal elves to get rid of their mutability so that they could take permanent shapes. That way, they could use those permanent shapes to enact a physical difference in the world. Essentially, one had to get rid of some of their freedom for glory. The primal elves all accepted and took on the shapes of the elves that you know and see today. Now, this change started the rift between Coralyn and Arushni. Coralyn ended up banning all of the primal elves, the ones who were not gods, out of Arvandor as punishment for doing this, for he was deeply offended that they had forsaken their freedom and chaotic forms. Eventually, Arushni betrayed Coralyn and tried to kill him by siding with evil gods such as Grumsh and Mal but ultimately failed in slaying him and as such she was transformed into a demon and banished to the abyss, at which point she took on a new name, Loth, the Queen of Spiders. Now, why was this whole backstory important? Well, it is actually hugely important because religion is basically 90% of elvish culture, and most of everything that they do revolves around Coraline and the Seldarine Pantheon, the elvish pantheon. 
For example, you probably didn't know that elves don't truly die forever and instead they actually follow a cycle of reincarnation every single time they pass away. Elves are essentially banished from their heaven until the time when Coraline can actually truly forgive them for their transgression in changing their mutability. And I also forgot to mention that when the elves got rid of this mutability, it also heavily affected Coraline's ability to mutate, which really pissed him off. That was everything about him, basically. So when an elf dies because they're banned from their heaven, they are only allowed in there for a very short period of time before their soul gets just sent back into the prime material realm to be born as another elf. This is also one of the reasons why elves don't reproduce as fast as humans do. There is a limited number of elvish souls in existence that gets recycled over and over again. In fact, it is well known in elvish culture that if a lot of elvish babies babies are born in a century, something terrible is typically going to happen because Coraline wouldn't send so many souls into the world unless something bad was going to happen that would need a lot of elves to fix. Getting a lot of elvish babies back to back to back is a very bad omen. Another example of how important this is comes in the way of the trance that elves are known for. See, elves don't need to sleep in the same way as humanoids do. Instead, they essentially meditate with their eyes open in what we call a trance, something that they have to do for at least four hours a day. Now, trance is a crude name used by humanoids to describe how it looks, because it indeed looks like the elf is in some kind of trance, but the real name is the reverie. The meaning of reverie is, quote, a state of being pleasantly lost in one's thoughts, end quote. And it actually describes their state perfectly. When an elf enters reverie, they can recall any memory of their lives and essentially relive it. They do this to recall beautiful moments of their life and replay it back in their head to find inner peace. Or they recall training sessions with their masters in order to further practice even while resting. This is the reason why elves appreciate the smaller details, why they get lost in staring at a flower, and why they're not interested in high-octane adventure. They do their best to find truly unique experiences, so they can replay those experiences whenever they desire. The question that no one was asking, however, but that should have been asked, is how does the reverie work when the elf is basically a baby? How far back can an elf go when they search for their memories? It gets really crazy, guys. Have you ever wondered how does an elf define when he is an adult. I mean, think about it. For a human, 18 years old just sounds about right, because 15 and 16 years old sounds far too young, and 25 sounds far too old. But could you imagine trying to do that math in your head with an elf? An elf is supposed to become an adult at around age 100, but why 100? Is 95 years old too young? Is 110 years old too old? See, the reverie is more than simply a way for elves to rest and recall memories, like the player's handbook would have you believe. In reality, it is through the reverie that elves figure out in which stage of their life they are in. For the first 30 years of an elf's life, the elf can't actually recall any experience using their trance. Instead, they can actually recall memories from when they used to be primal spirits back in Urbandor, back in the days when they used to frolic and dance with their gods, or when they used to exist all-powerful in the Feywild in the very early days of their creation. It is actually in very bad taste for an elf this young to speak of these memories to their elders, for every elf longs to return back to those days and hearing about those memories make them solemn and melancholy. They are, however, pushed to explore those memories, to truly experience them for as long as they can because the memories will not last forever. In fact, as the elf grows older, they will slowly lose the ability to recall these primal days until the day when they can no longer recall a single of these memories. These memories, instead, from the time they hit 30, will start to be replaced with their own memories of their current life until they completely take over at around age 100. 
The first time a young elf is able to recollect a personal memory with their trance at around age 30 is called the first reflection, and this generally marks the child's passing into adolescence. When memories of their life completely take over the memories of their primal past, that is called the drawing of the veil, and it marks the adolescent elf entering adulthood. Now, when this happens, it is actually a very sad moment for the elf. I mean, you have to understand that being able to perfectly recollect memories of perfect happiness with your god in heaven and all the other spirits of your people and then losing the ability to relive it and recollect it, yikes. It is a very traumatic experience that all elves go through and as such, elves actually make a celebration of it to try and offset the melancholy as much as they can, like a rite of passage into adulthood. In any case, this is why every single elf knows very well of their place in the universe, and they know very well of their god's disappointment and why they are banished from their wonderland. And that's why every single elf strives to be the perfect elf, so they may be welcomed back in there one day. Generally speaking, if you play an elf in any campaign in Dungeons & Dragons, this is the stage of life that you will typically adventure in after being 100 years old, what they call the adult stage. The reason for it is because now that the reverie is completely taken with your own memories, the elf now tries to fill his reverie with great adventures and memories, getting crazy experiences out there so that then they can recollect those experiences with the reverie. Now this stage of adventure typically lasts around 300 years, but then when the elf actually reaches their 400 year mark, their trance once again starts changing. At this point, the elf will start to randomly be given images and memories of other lives that the elf has lived. Essentially a glimpse into some of the reincarnations that the elf has done in the past. But some even claim that the elf will get memories of other elves in other lives. This we call the remembrance or the revelation. These images and memories will start slow, but eventually become so real that they literally start shifting the focus of the elf, making the elf become more focused on the bigger elvish picture, focused on community, focused on their place in the multiverse, and focused on primarily going back home. And this is when the elf goes from being an adult to being in the elder stage. Keep in mind, by the way, that the elf will still look like he is around 30 years old or something else literally do not age at least not until they are a couple of decades close to dying and well that won't happen for a very very long time still it's interesting too that the more active an elf is in their life the more adventures they go through and the more they accomplish in an active way the faster this stage will come upon the elf but there's more to it too the more times an elf gets killed and revived the faster the remembrance will come but the thing that speeds it up the most by far which is weird is the feywild Constant contact with the Feywild actually speeds up this stage of life the most. In fact, the lore actually states that if an elf stays a couple of decades in the Feywild, they might get their remembrance as early as their second century. So now you understand it, the elves don't use the number of winters that they have lived through to determine whether they are an adult or an elf. They actually use the types of memories, the type of feelings that they get from the winter trends to define these sort of things. Which again goes back to their god, to their religion. See how everything is just intertwined with religion in their culture. Now the thing about elves and how long they can live after they reach elder status is that it appears to be for the most part predetermined by the gods before they are even born. At any point in time after an elf reaches elder status, likely a, a hundred or two hundred years from that, a sure sign from the gods will show in their bodies that will tell them that their time is soon to come. When an elf that is close to dying from old age enters reverie, enters a trance, cataracts in the shape of crescents pointing down will appear over the pupils of both eyes. Quote, this change, commonly known as transcendence, is evidence that Sehanin Munbo has opened the door to enable the elves' soul to return to Arvandor, a direct sign from the gods that it is time to get one's affairs in order. How much time an elf's body has left is never certain. 
Whether hours or years, the period is marked by both an intense joy and great sadness. Most mortal elves accept their upcoming fate with optimism or resignation, but some react by throwing themselves back into the labors of life with a frenzy other elves consider unbecoming. Elves who die of old age without experiencing transcendence are believed to have been denied admission to our Vandor, and thus their souls pass on to other planes and are never reincarnated. The living are left to guess why this might be true, but an elf's conduct during life will often offer a clue. Drow never experienced transcendence, and the same is true for elves who turn to the worship of gods other than the Seldarine. End quote. Now this actually gives us a really cool segue into the Dark Elves, which is everything about them is very, very interesting. But first, let's go over to the beginnings of the Elvish Empire, which we kind of need to cover. The lore states that the elves lived on the Feywild for tens of thousands of years, that being the place they essentially got banished to after the schism between Coraline and Loth. The Fey Lords eventually decided to open portals and gateways into Faerun in order to contest the dragon's dominion over the land. This is when the elves moved in into the planet first. The first wave of elves to move on to the world were the Avariel, who are known as the Winged Elves, then the Green Elves, who nowadays we know as the Wild Elves, and the Lithari, which were kind of the first werewolves. The Avariel were absolutely obliterated by the dragons. I mean, they literally almost went extinct. The only reason they survived at all was because they decided to live on the land instead of flying, living as hermits and vagabonds. They traveled as far east as they could in order to escape the Empire of Dragons, avoiding them at all costs and basically just hiding for thousands of years. The Green Elves and the Lithari kept to themselves without trying to anger the dragons, hiding in the forests. Generally speaking, this first wave of elves did pretty bad. It wasn't until the second wave of elves coming from the Feywild when things really started to pick up for them, because this is when the Gold Elves, the Moon Elves, the Aquatic Elves, and the Dark Elves came into the world. These elves were already great at spellcasting, were very numerous and intelligent, and they managed to essentially end the reign of dragons with their combined might. And just like that, they started forming empires all across Faerun. This is what we call the first flowering, when the elvish people spread all across to form their empires. Now, these empires were incredible, and much of what is awesome about elvish culture essentially formed here, and it was here that high magic started to be born. We're going to talk about high magic on the next episode, but know that high magic is essentially the way that elves manage to do literally everything cool that they have ever done. A magic that essentially rivals 11th level spells. It's a completely different type of magic, and unlike normal true spells, there's actually no limit to how powerful they can be. In fact, the scope of many of these high magic spells actually rival that of Karzis' avatar, the only 12 level spell. And some of these high magic spells are literally on the same level of power. In fact, screw it, let's talk about one of them. This is gonna show you guys. During this time period, during the first flowering, the elves followed a prophecy where they actually attempted to bring a piece of heaven into the real world. They wanted to bring a piece of our Vandor from the upper plane down here to the material plane, essentially shifting and breaking apart the rules of the cosmos. See, when elves get old, when they start reaching their elder stage, they start to feel the call to our Vandor, an indescribable and unrelenting yearning to return to their heaven. This was the catalyst for them to try this sacrilege, for them to have a piece of heaven down on earth where they could live and not feel this yearning any longer. The elves performed an incredible high magic ritual with hundreds and hundreds of participants in the casting of this grand spell. The lore describes that hundreds of years of preparation of the spell was in order, and the best mages of all of Faerun all came together to be part of this grand ritual. The spell was called Uaul Selu Kereth, which roughly translates to At War with the Weave. 
terrible earthquakes as a result of the spell tore the fabric of reality and time and space. It sundered the land and broke it, killing untold number of elves and destroying thousands of settlements. The spell was actually going to destroy Faerun if it wasn't for the intervention of the gods who helped finish the casting, and at the end a massive island rose from the bottom of the sea in the middle of the trackless sea. The island that the elf would know as Evermeet, the island that would forever become their home. Quote, Millennia later, Evermeet still exists, although now it is unmoored from the world, somewhere in the space between the Feywild Arvandor and the Material Plane. By using secret pathways, entering a fairy ring on special nights, or traversing a moonlit sea by following certain stars, Elves of many worlds can get to Evermeet if they are lucky. Even from Faerun, for instance, one can sail to Evermeet only on a ship captained by an elf who has been there before. And if the captain slips up, the ship might become adrift on the astral plane. Despite all of these obstacles, when elves feel the pull to Arvandor, some find the way to assuage that feeling by traveling to Evermeet instead. Unlike on Arvandor, elves who visit Eremit can do so for as long as they like and leave when they want, or can choose to stay, as many elves do in the latter decades of their lives." End quote. The island itself is a miracle, a literal piece of heaven on earth, where the rules of magic and life are different. A place where certain elves can become demigods, a place where elves can migrate to in order to quench their desire for heaven and live the rest of their lives in peace. The land exists in both Inarvandor and the Material Plane and the Feywild all simultaneously, and for millennia it was ruled by the only true queen of all elves. This is just but a taste of what high magic can do, and we will cover all of the high magic spells that exist within the next few episodes. I have casting times, I have components needed, how many elves are needed per spell, the exact effect of the spells, I have it all. It's really cool guys, so make sure that you watch the next couple of videos that I'll be releasing, I'm gonna cover all of it. But anyways, during this time period elves created many spells, though unfortunately there really aren't many that we still use nowadays. Unlike the Netherese who created virtually every single spell that we still use, like magic missiles and shield and fireball. The Netherese actually wanted their spells spread all across the world because it brought glory to their kingdom and, and fame to the wizard who invented it. But the elves were never really like that at all, in fact, quite the opposite. They were always wary that their spells would be used for evil, so they kept them secret. And where did they keep them? Well, in Evermeet, of course. Evermeet is a trove of ancient elvish treasures and spells. It is, in fact, there in Evermeet where the elves keep some of their most famous spells. Spells like the 6th level spell Anti-Magic Aura, a spell that works like the anti-magic field but concentrated on a single person so that that person cannot cast any spells. A broken and awesome spell, or the 7th level spell Gunship, which allows ships to fly in the air, or the incredibly powerful 9th level spell Gift of Life, which allows a cleric to turn any undead back to life. Thank you guys so much for watching, make sure that you stick through on the channel, subscribe, uh, uh, click the bell button to be notified whenever I upload because we will be releasing the second part of this video. We still have a ton more stuff to cover about the elves, where we're going to be talking about the Dark Elves, how they became essentially cursed, and of course the actual anatomy of the elves. If you want to know how their brain works, what special glands they have that humans don't have, uh, how they even get dark vision. I, I know how they can see in the dark even without light. It's a very special process that elves can do. All of it really interesting, so make sure that you stick through and subscribe to see the next video. Then after that we'll cover high magic and all of the different spells. Very interesting stuff. Anyways, I want to thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Daniel Luna, Dr. Cowbell, Skitsio Boy, Alisa Russell, Major Fail Gaming, Great Codini, Sayliog, Barry Maskand, 5E Magic Shop, Dog Feeder, Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Zach Bowell, Brad Salazar, Gesher Nem, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Kosh Bane, and Mediogre Adbest for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. 
If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash mrrex to support. Guys, in the meantime, before I upload the other videos, which I will be uploading every two days, make sure to go and watch the playlist for all of my Dungeons & Dragons videos. They are fantastic, I promise you, they're all as good as this one, and we have covered so many monsters and so many topics of D&D, so please just lose yourself in the playlist. <laughs> It'll be great. Anyways, guys, see you all in the next video two days from now. Bye-bye.